Good morning, everybody. How was everybody this morning? Good. Good? Yeah, I like this cooler weather. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've, in this class, Discipleship 101, we've uh, learned about who God is. We've learned about the kingdom of God, and we've learned about his righteousness and what that means, right? Everybody with me? Yeah. So, um, today's kind of uh, exciting to me as well. I, I mean, I guess anytime I get in the Word and dig in the Word and, and learn more, it always excites me. And so, um, I just want to pray before we start. Lord God, thank you that you are so good to us. God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for all that he did for us, Lord God. He obtained righteousness for us that we could be righteous. He obtained righteousness for God, for, so that we could have be um, free of sin, and so that we could be um, have an open heaven with you, so that we could have what you have. We could we could do what Jesus did. We could be um, just true disciples, be followers, and do the things we saw Jesus doing as He did what He saw you doing. God, we thank you for that. We praise your name. We pray that you just empower us this morning and show us and teach us, Lord God, what you want us to hear, what you want us to see and learn. And understand about you and your kingdom and your righteousness and, and how that brings glory to your name. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So it's pretty awesome. I mean, when you put everything together um, about who God is, about what he says about us, you know, who we are, um, and what we have, the righteousness, righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus, the open heaven that that made for us, that made us a way to have a relationship with God, but not only that, but to, that we are empowered through Christ in us. So um, in Colossians, actually Shirley reminded me of this this morning, Colossians 1, I'm going to start at 25, this is Paul. He's saying, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for, our, for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God, that is, the mystery that has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now been manifested to His saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches and the glory of His ministry among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, hopefully you're getting this. Uh, I just, uh, I really want, hopefully you get what we're, I'm trying to get across. I don't know if I am or not, but you, but Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is what you've got in you right now. You have the open heaven because of Christ in you. You've gotten Christ's um, righteousness because of Christ in you. He's passed that on to you because of him and what he's done to you and in you. So I'm hoping that you're grasping this because it gives you the power to live in the kingdom and live in kingdom principles and live in the kingdom power and be able to do the things that Jesus did. And so that's what kind of we're going to go over today a little bit is the believer's authority. When you believe in Jesus and you believe in these things, believe what God did for you, believe what Christ did, then that gives you the authority to do some things and do the things that Jesus did while he was on this earth in his ministry. He was, he said, why did he say he came? To preach the gospel, right? To other cities, to preach the kingdom to other cities. That's why he came. And we also learned that um, he came to destroy the works of the devil, which basically is, means the same thing. So to believe. Believe is to have confidence in the truth, the existence, or the reliability of something. Only if, if one believes in something can one act purposefully. So if you half-heartedly believe in something, you're half-heartedly going to to do what you that thing you know so um, you you wouldn't follow Christ all the way you wouldn't let him in your heart all the way unless you truly believe with all of your heart that that he is the king he is did what he did he is in you and he does um, give you that righteousness and that you can do the things he did uh, according to his word so faith faith strong or unshakable belief in something especially without proof or evidence Simply trust God um, with a small, small child mentality. So we just have to put all that faith that what he said, we didn't see Jesus do those things, right? We didn't see um, those things, but we, but we know it's true, right? We have to have faith and know it's true. That's the faith. The faith is, 
um, believing that it did happen, believing that he did multiply the food, you know, for thousands of people, knowing that when he went to, um, uh, you know, he told Peter, go to the, go fish, you know, and he brought back, uh, he, the first fish he got had gold in his mouth or denarii or something, and he brought it back and paid the taxes. He, um, he did all kinds of things. He turned water into wine at, at the wedding ceremony. He, he, um, it wasn't just healing, you know, he, um, he took care of the the um, the widow that didn't have any didn't have anything, and and he, and he made the jars of oil keep overflowing, and the and the um, and the flour keep overflowing, or so they would have plenty, right? So he does all kinds of things for us. He he um, so healing is is a lot of what I'm going to talk about today because and and the power that we have and the authority we have. So trust it, trust reliance on the integrity. Strength, ability, surety, etc., of a person or thing. Confidence. God is my trust, right? So this is one thing that, that we talked about. Um, I think it was the very first time about who God is, and it, it goes on with everything in His Word. And it says in Psalms one nineteen eighty nine, forever, O Lord, Your word is settled in heaven. It is settled. It is. It is fixed. It is. Um, it is conclusive. It is the end. It's the final thing, right? It's that's God's word. It doesn't change. It doesn't move. It doesn't. It is final. So in John six twenty eight and twenty nine, they replied, "We want to perform works too. What what should we do?" Jesus told them, "This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one." He has sent. So if you don't truly believe in what Jesus did, if you don't truly believe that He is in you and that He's transferred that, that righteousness to you and He's transferred uh, the, the ability to have an open heaven, then it's, it's hard to believe anything else because that's kind of the basis on which we stand uh, today in, in being a disciple of Jesus. All the things that He accomplished and did in you he did on this earth, you know, to establish righteousness. He did on this earth to for forgiveness of sin, but he also did it for you that you could it, he could stick it in you, and you could have that open heaven. And so that's what we're we're trying to to accomplish um, in your thinking and your and your mindset. Because as a man thinketh, so is he, right? So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So you have to keep thinking about who you really are in Christ. You that's who you are. You are Christ's field. You have his righteousness. He's passed that on to you. It's an inheritance. And I'm going to keep on hitting on that, <clears throat> that today because that is so important for everyone to understand is your standing. Who are you? What did he do for you? What did Christ do for you that you could be, that you could go out and do these things, do the things that he did, be a follower of, of Christ, be a disciple? 1 John 3.23, and this is his commandment that that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Romans 10.9 That if thou shalt confess with thy, mouth the, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. So uh, again, He's showing you how He's taken care of you and what you, have, what you must believe in. Matthew 8, 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed from that moment. So there are 26 examples um, in the Bible of Jesus telling someone to believe in, in, a, in a NASB version um, to continue to, to believe and believe and believe. You know, so in Galatians um, 2, 16, um, Know that a person is, is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have, have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because the works of the law, no one will be justified. You will never be justified by what you do. So we have to get rid of that do-get mentality. Remember that? The do-get mentality is where you think you have to do something. You think you have to get better. You think you have to do something to please God. And that's not what he's saying here. Um, 
in no works that you do will ever justify you. Will not happen. Only the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and what he put stuck in you, that righteousness that you have in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Matthew 21, 21, Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what um, was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. So the key thing is here, I underline is faith and do not doubt. Get it, we have to get it in our hearts. We have to get it in us. I would, I would just pray that God would just put that in your heart, give you a better understanding of that so that you can have faith in it and not back off of it and not back off of the truth that He's given us. He's given us so much truth here, and we, but we, it's so hard to understand it or believe it because our flesh is trying to say, well, that can't be true. And the flesh, remember, is always in, um, is always in uh, conflict with the Spirit. The Spirit knows it's true, but the flesh is constantly telling us, that can't be true, that doesn't make sense. But nothing makes sense to the flesh and the Spirit. So keep that in mind. So authority... Genesis 1.26 And God said, Let us make man in our image, um, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So he's, he, in the beginning, God gave us authority, right? But then we kind of messed that up. So then that's why he had to send Jesus, right? But he originally intended for us to have that have authority on the earth. The cool thing is now, it's not just authority on the earth, it's authority we share in the inheritance of Jesus that have an authority on the earth, but also the heavens and under the earth. We have authority over demons. We have authority over um, a lot of things that we didn't have authority in the beginning. So that's pretty exciting to me. So dominion is to rule over, to control, to have sovereign authority over something. And the thing is, we have a sovereign God, right? God is the God is the all authority over all things. the The thing that God has done here, though, is He has um, He has taken His authority, His sovereignty, and He said, "I want to give you for authority on this earth. I want to give you righteousness, so you can make the difference, so you can follow Christ, and you can do the things that Christ did. I want to give that authority to you." So that's what God did. So and. and um, John 3, 16, 3, 6, excuse me. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. I kind of got ahead of myself, but it's what that whole thing is talking about is to have a flesh and a spirit. They don't they don't get they don't understand each other basically. They're they're in conflict. Um, because the flesh cannot understand what the spirit of God is doing. So um, John 10 34, Jesus answered them. Has it not been written in your law? I said you were gods. Um, we talked about that a little bit last Sunday, I believe. Um, so so uh, we are gods in a certain sense. Um, he said that we were. And so we are in a certain sense that we have Christ in us. He's made us gods on this earth because Christ is in us and for those of us who believe. Matthew 18, 1 through 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called the child unto himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are uh, converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as a child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And what he's talking about humbling yourself and being like a child is that you have to humble yourself and <coughs> excuse me and believe in what he accomplished. Believe that he sent his son and he died for you and he 
and he was raised from the dead and he transferred that righteousness onto you and that he stuck that in you and that you have that righteousness now and that you can go out and make a difference right now. That's what he's talking about. To humble yourself that means to, to understand that he is the God at work in you. Is The things that you do, you don't do on your own. You do that with Christ in you. Christ is doing it. Holy Spirit is doing it. God is doing that in you through you to help others, that's where you get the power and authority because you have an open heaven. You're calling upon heaven to help you because Christ is in you. Does that make sense to everybody? Maybe? <laughs> Hopefully. <clears throat> Ephesians 3.20 Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Whose power works in us? Where does that come from? Right? The open heaven, the righteousness that we have with Jesus, the right standing we have with God, that is that is um, the power that works in us. It's God's grace, His ability to do things, His ability, right? Not our own, but His His love, His ability to, to work through us and to help other people. So from the beginning, we were intended to rule over the earth and everything in it. And now we have even more. Um, Matthew 28:18. I'm going kind of fast today because I, I, this is not all I'm going to talk about actually. Um, so hang in there, <laughs> buckle your seatbelts. So, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, "All power is given unto me in heaven and in the in earth." So, yeah, all the power was given to Jesus, right? All, right? And then, what did Jesus do for us? He transferred that. And he lives in us, giving us that. He's coming, made himself one with us. We, right? We are a new species, right? It says in the Bible, we have uh, crossed over from death to life. The old is gone. The new is here. The new is Jesus in us. The new is where he's combined himself. And I like the way that Pastor Scott says it. Like it's like a, a a pickle, right? When you pickle a cucumber, you can't unpickle that cucumber. So that's kind of how it is. You can't unpickle you. Once Jesus is in you, it doesn't get undone. Jesus has combined his spirit with your spirit, so now you are may have been made one with Christ. And who does Christ say he's one with? The Father. And they're one with the Holy Spirit. They're, God is one, and we are now one with him. So that is, that is incredible to me, to even think that someone who messes up as much as I do, that Christ is in me, and Christ will work through me no matter what, because I didn't do it, and I can't undo it. Right? I had nothing to do with it. He did it for me. So I just, I, that baffles me that he uses me that way. Um, Romans 8, 11, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies of His spirit, uh, because of his spirit who lives in you. Again, that's what he's saying. Wow. If the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then how can you how can you not um, be successful? How can you not go help people? How can you not you know do the things of Jesus? If that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, I mean, think about that for a second. The Spirit that raised Him from the dead. I mean, they killed Him, right? They stuck a spear in His side to make sure He was dead, right? He was dead. And they rose, the Spirit raised him up from the dead, right? If that Spirit that can raise Jesus from the dead is in you, then what excuses do we have? We don't have any. Who can be against you, right? The power of God, the very living God lives in you that raised him from the dead. That is incredible, guys. 1 John 4.4 4, You, dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one in the world. Satan has no hold on us. Satan has no power over us. All the power, all authority in the heavens and the earth were given to Jesus, right? And we are, we have inherited that with him, right? We are sons of the Most High, right? So who can be against us? The one in the world is Satan. That's what he's talking about. That's the one in the world. Satan has no hold. He has no power over us. He has no authority. It's all been taken from him. 1 Corinthians 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given us by God. Again, he's, t he's telling us the word. So it's so showing us over and over and over about the spirit we have in us, that he's stuck in us, right? Um, 2 Peter 1.3 for His divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who created us by His own glory and excellence. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 8.15 For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Right? Abba, Father. Our God in heaven, right, is letting us call Him Father. He's showing us that He is our Father. He's sent His Son so He could stick Him in us and give us authority, and show so we could have we could have a relationship with Him, but also go out and do the things to help other people. Because God loves people. I don't know if you all knew that or not. He loves people. He loves every single one of you. You, each one of you, are His favorite. You know. <laughs> And it's, it's kind of hard to get your mind wrapped around that. Well, if you have a favorite, then how can everybody be the favorite? But we are. We are each one because he made us all different. His favorite. He loves each one of us so much. So 1 John 4, 15. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. So again, he's telling us that spirit is in us. He is in us and with us. And God, in Ephesians uh, 2, 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 8, 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is, nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in, with God, right? We are made one with Him. So when you eat a cucumber, can you taste the, I mean, excuse me, a pickle, can you, does it taste like the old cucumber? No. You can't really taste the cucumber anymore, can you? <laughs> that's, kind of, that's how it is with us. You can't taste the old us anymore taste the new the new you god has made you into something else that you didn't used to be so so if your fragrance changes so god talks about a fragrance that he puts out he talks about a fragrance that you give out when you have the sun in you so does a cucumber smell or smell the same as a pickle no it gives out a different fragrance doesn't it so same with us we put out a different fragrance when you accept jesus christ and he comes into you and you are pickled with him, you know, stuck in you uh, his righteousness, he stuck in you his spirit, right? That raised Jesus from the dead. He stuck this in you, and your fragrance changes. The way that you do things changes. The way you think about things changes. Um, the way that you act changes. It may not, some for some people right away, it may not be that quick, but it, you know, it continually changes. You know? I mean, when you put a, a cucumber in the in the uh, pressure cooker when you're making a pickle, right? The cucumber doesn't change like that, right? It's like not the moment you put it in there, but it takes a little bit of time for it to cook, right? And get that and for that process to happen. And the same time sometimes with a lot of us and most of us it takes a little bit of time. So that so don't worry about it if you're if you feel like I'm still acting the same way I did, I'm still not doing things differently, I, I don't feel differently. Don't worry about that. Concentrate on what he did. Think about and focus on what he did for you, what he's doing for you, and focus on the things that he said that, and how much he loves you and things like that. And that gives you that gives you a, a boost, I guess you might say, to go and want to do the things. Once you understand what Jesus did and all he went through, it makes you want to go and do the things he did. It makes you want to go help other people. You know, whether it's helping someone uh, across the road, an elderly person or a handicapped person, or whether it's going to get a drink of water for someone, you know, who, who's pushing a walker or having, having a hard time walking or, or whatever, or coughing or whatever, you know, just doing things to help people. That's what he wants us to do, right? He wants us to be out there, but he doesn't only want that. 
He also wants you to go do the things that we saw him do, right? He wants you to go out and help those who are oppressed, help those that are depressed, help those that are sick, help those in a lot of different ways and become the resource for each and every person that you come, come in contact with that, um, that needs something, you have it. Because you have the power that raised Jesus from the dead in you. And he can work through you. That same spirit works through you to help others. Colossians uh, 1, 26-28 That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations. Um, and I'm reading this over again. I started with this in the beginning. Um, but has now been manifested to his saints. Who are his saints? We are his saints. Right? It's been manifested to his saints, to us, right? To whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery up until now. It's not a mystery anymore. Christ is in you. You have the righteousness. You have an open heaven. You can go out and do the things Jesus did. You can go out and accomplish these things. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so they may present every man complete in Christ. So Matthew 4, 23 through 24. Jesus was going um, throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. How? What kinds of disease and sickness? Every, right? Every one of them. Um, among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demon, uh, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, and the, and the, I don't even know how to say this, the Decapolis. In Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Okay, so we see Jesus is healing everyone, right? He's he's casting out devils like he told us to do, right? Like he said, he told his disciples to cast out devils, right? He told his disciples to, to raise the dead, right? To heal the sick, right? He told us to do all these things and he's he's showing us there, he's demonstrating it. And there's there's lots and lots and lots of scripture that continue to go on about when Jesus' ministry on earth and all the different people he healed and all the miracles he did and all the things he, he did, the resource he became for all of us, right? But then in Acts 5, 12 through 16, it's talking about the result of what he did in us, right? It says, at the hands of the apostles, the hands of the apostles, right? Many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with, uh, with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with him. However, the people held them in high esteem, and, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were const constantly added to their number to such an extent that they even carried the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. So this is not Jesus doing it while he's in the flesh body on this earth. This is Jesus doing it in somebody. This is where they know, they understand that they, that they have this power and authority because Jesus gained their righteousness. They have an open heaven and he stuck that in them so they can, they can do the things that Jesus did. They're, they're demonstrating that here. So um, and then Matthew 10, 24 through 25, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul. Beelzebub. <laughs> Beelzebub. Never say that. Beelzebub. Uh, how much more will they will they 
and malign the members of the household. So we're not above Jesus. We're not above God. You know, we're not above the Holy Spirit. We're not above Father. But but He has come and stuck in us so that we could be we could be um, not above Him, but we could be like Him, and we can do those things like Him. Luke six forty. The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. Right. So. We who believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord have been made perfect, which is synonymous with being made righteous, right? We are not above Jesus, but we have been given the very righteousness of Jesus and inherited with Jesus the open heaven. God has placed in us his very nature through the Holy Spirit, which is at work in us, the scripture says. This is the mystery of that has now been revealed, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So, I was hoping I wasn't too far along, at, at getting too close to being out of time. I was trying to kind of hurry through that. So, um, I just, I, I think a lot of you know um, what happened to me with COVID and everything. I, I don't know if, if anybody doesn't know. Um, so, but there's, it goes back a little bit further than that. I had, um, I had cancer too. Um, not at that time, two years prior so I found out I had cancer, and um, um, you know, I I believe this a hundred a hundred percent. I I actually told people before in my past that if anything ever happened to me, I told my son, I said anything ever happened to me, I never want to get have a doctor um, resuscitate me or anybody resuscitate me. But God, <laughs> I told my son that one time, and I didn't really want to think I'd ever go to a doctor again. I didn't for a long time, and and stuff, and. And, but Satan does do some works on you. Uh, he throws some, some uh, monkey wrenches in there for you and trouble to come your way. But the, the cool thing is, is that even when trouble comes, God says, Jesus said, I, I've already overcome the world, right? I've already overcome these things. Trust in me. And so when I had cancer, I was, I was a little bit concerned about it. And um, I, started, I told my family about what my wishes were because I didn't know if I was going to live through that whole thing. And it, because it became an emergency surgery, um, I had this pain in my gut for like six months, and I finally went to the doctor, got a colonoscopy and a CT scan, found out I had cancer. Um, and um, when and when I the about a week after I found out I had cancer, um, the pain got really bad all of a sudden. So I went to the, to back to the doctor, and the doctor that was supposed to do the surgery was on vacation. <laughs> so. Uh, it turned out to be a godsend because the um, that doctor being on vacation, he was going to do uh, he was going to remove the mass laparoscopically, um, so he wasn't going to you know make a big cut and, and that kind of thing. So uh, well, when I went in there, I had to see a different doctor, and he happened to be a senior surgeon, had he had a lot more experience and stuff, and he pushed on my gut and. And he's like, well, you're in way too much pain. You know, I, I think that this has now become an emergency. So we did. So he did the emergency surgery, but some things happened while he was in the in there. The surgery is supposed to only take about two hours, but it took about it took over five hours. And the reason when he first opened me up, and he decided he said something was telling him to open me up, not to do a laparoscopy. So I have a big scar, um, like the old-fashioned uh, C-section. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I had this big, huge scar, and um, but he, when he opened me up, he did. At first, didn't think he's even going to be able to help me. He's there was something called stranding, and stranding is, uh, I guess, the fatty tissue or something, but it, it makes these strands from an object that is extra weight that your body is not um, is not wasn't originally created to handle, right? And it, it creates these strands that goes to different um, organs and different places that attach itself inside your body to support that extra weight. And But there was so much of it, he was like, I don't I don't think I can help this guy. And then he saw my age and he's like, well, I, I, I'm gonna try, have to try, you know, because I, I was only 47 at the time. So he said, so uh, anyway, he cut all that loose and then he saw something else he had never saw before. He had never seen that much stranding ever. And then he saw something else, he's like, there is a sack that completely surrounded the the um, the tumor. It was uh, he said he had never saw it before, but also 
that tumor had actually perforated the side of my colon, and so all that stuff that's inside your colon that you don't want in your body floating around, <laughs> um, that, makes, that can make you become sepsis and can make you really sick, and you could actually die from that. So I actually had a grandmother that, that happened to you. But anyway, um, that sac contained all of that stuff. So when it perforated my, the wall of my colon, it actually, that stuff was contained in there, so it didn't get out into the rest of my body. So, so he said he'd never ever seen that before. And I, I just say, you know, the power that's in me that raised Jesus from the dead did that, you know? He combined my, his spirit with my spirit, so he did that. And also, it wasn't just that, and it wasn't, I mean, it was, you know, it was just that, but also the prayers. I had I'd come to different um, people for prayer. I went to the elders for prayer. Uh, like it says in James, and so I was the elders, and they prayed. They prayed over me and things, and, um, um, and I think that had something to do with it as well. I don't know everything about everything, but I do know that, that um, the prayers of other people the, and the power of God that's at work in them and in me can make changes to, and it can help people. So that was going on, right? So he took that whole thing out, um, and. The, uh, the mass was six pounds approximately. So so I, I told my wife I've had my baby. She had a lot of our, our kids C-section, but hers is the new way, you know, horizontally. Mine's the old-fashioned way. It's this way. <laughs> so, um, but um, our, all, our, all of our kids were like six pounds right around there. Give or take a few ounces, but right around six pounds. And my mass was around six pounds too. <laughs> so... I don't believe in abortion, but that one got aborted. <laughs> um, but anyway, we uh, so that that happened, and then God healed me really fast. They told me I'd be in the hospital for a week. I was only there for uh, I think three days. Um, got out of there, I healed really quickly. Back to work um, really soon. Uh, so that happened. But then fast forward to um, to a couple of years ago, a year and a half. Well, it's almost been two years now. Um, I got COVID. My whole family got COVID. We all. Um, I'm the only one that really got sick. <laughs> Again, there are people praying. There are lots and lots of people praying, thousands of people praying. I don't even know uh, the extent of it. Um, I was told there's people all over, um, even all over the world that were praying for me just because of associations with other people that were Christian that were praying for me. You know, so um, but I but I uh, went to the hospital on September 10th. My oxygen was at about 78 percent. And um, I don't remember the ride there. I, I took a ride in the ambulance, and I don't remember. I remember them putting me in there, but I don't remember getting there or the ride in between. And I don't remember anything, really, for about two weeks um, from that time. So um, when I finally woke up, but the, there's an incredible story that happened <laughs> that I didn't get. I didn't personally, I experienced it, but I didn't knowingly experience it. You know, I didn't, I get, I didn't get to see it, but lots of other people did. And so that, that experience for me, people always ask me for my testimony, but I'm like, you know, you have a testimony. You have a testimony of what you saw happen with me. Because what happened to me was I got really, really sick. I signed a DNR and a DNI somehow. I don't recall that. Um, no extreme measures. And um, a DNI is do not intubate, so they couldn't put a tube in, right? So they couldn't put a vent tube in or anything in me. They couldn't uh, resuscitate me, so they couldn't do CPR or anything. Um, and so they said that was just in case things got bad. Well, the, that night, things got bad. My oxygen dropped down to 40%. They learned that I was that I had sepsis. I, my body was filled up with infection. My lungs were filled up with infection, with, and they called it COVID pneumonia. Um, they, um, I was in really, really bad shape. They they couldn't put me on a vent, so they put me on a BiPAP machine. The BiPAP machine would put out 100 liters of oxygen, 100 liters, 100 liters of minute was its maximum, and that's what it was on and for approximately a week. And at, at during that week, or at the end of that week, um, because of all that pressure, my lungs were perforated, and they got perforated, which, so they have, I got a lot of holes in the, the air started coming underneath my skin, in my arms, my neck, my body cavity, um, so they knew my lungs were perforated. So they um, gave my, my family a, um, a choice, uh, turn off the machine, and more than likely because of uh, 
pneumonia and all the stuff going on I, and where my oxygen level was before they put me on that, I, it would probably drop down and I would, I would die. I probably wouldn't live more than a half an hour to an hour. Um, if they left me on the machine, it's just going to probably keep tearing my lungs up. You have to have lungs to live. So the prognosis was if you do it this way, he's going to die. If you do it that way, he's going to die. So it wasn't very good uh, odds either way. Um, basically, they didn't give me any positive odds from what I understand. So, but I wasn't awake. So I guess that's the good part. I don't remember, remember any of that stuff. So, um, so then they um, put me on comfort care. They took me off the machine, put me on comfort care, they, uh, assuming that I would be gone in half an hour to an hour. Um, they had all the family come in, say their goodbyes, everything like that, and um, and I didn't die in an hour. I didn't die in two. I didn't die in three or four. The third day on comfort care, um, I finally died. I quit breathing. The nurse was in the room. She said uh, I, I was I was gone. Uh, checking my vitals. They take you off of everything. I don't know if you know comfort cares, but it's a lot like hospice. So they take you off of everything, and you just lay there, basically. So. Um, on the third day, that happened. I, I quit breathing, everything stopped, and um, and then uh, and then she went to get another nurse because they have to do that. The other nurse comes back. She also verified the same things that I wasn't breathing, everything, nothing was working. I was I was gone. And so then the then they go get the doctor, who's the one who has to actually technically call it and say that yes, you are gone and the time of death, all that kind of stuff. So. When the doctor got back to the room, God brought me back to life. Right? I, I don't remember it, but I'm here. <laughs> Other people remember it. You know, I wasn't. Yeah, but, we're glad you're here. But that's the power of God in us. You know? The power of God in us. So when all those people are praying and the and the faith they had that Jesus could do it, and Jesus was willing to do it, and he would do it. That's the power that raised me up. That power that lives in you. Jesus Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's the power that raised Jesus from the dead and raised me from the dead. That is what happened to me. And I can tell you that for sure. And then I can tell you that also because of this. <laughs> they told me I'd be in the hospital for at least two months because my lungs were so badly damaged and I had atrophy where I couldn't walk. I lost 40 pounds. When I couldn't walk, my muscles had deteriorated. I couldn't bear my own weight. And they said, okay, so we're going to have to go through some physical therapy, but you can't do very much at a time because your lungs won't be able to keep up. That's the way it was explained to me. So you're, so we're going to take baby steps, just a little bit of physical therapy every day um, to help get you back. So it's going to take a while. If you do too much, there'll be, there'll be setbacks and be like starting over again in certain aspects. So we want to just do baby steps. So I was I was moved over to the inpatient rehabilitation department. I was still on, and I don't remember exactly, but it's somewhere around 16 to 20 liters of oxygen at the time. So um, for some people might not understand what that means, but most of the people that you see that's pulling around a bottle or has, a, has one of those machines that, that uh, creates oxygen or pulls the oxygen out of the air, they're usually on somewhere between two and eight liters. Just right in that area. So I was, I was still on 16 to 20 liters when I went to rehabilitation. So they told me I would be on oxygen when I went in there, more than likely till sometime after the first of the year. This is on October 4th. Okay, so, at, so sometime after the first of the year, and so that's a long time. I'd still be on oxygen and they said that I probably wouldn't be able to get back to work because the atrophy and the slowness we had to build everything back up until after the first of the year and I was thinking to myself how in the world am I going to pay my bills you know but you know funny thing is God took care of that too while I was in the hospital uh, my nephew works he worked the same place I did and I sold cars and um, he told my wife or someone, I think it's my wife, that oh, he told me later too, that while I was in the hospital, there so many of my customers were coming in and, and buying cars that I was still number one salesperson at the dealership, <laughs> even while I was in the hospital for a month. <laughs> right? So God took care of my financial need too. 
he takes care of everything for us. So while I was, uh, so I'm not supposed to get, they say, um, after the first of the year, off the oxygen, after the first of the year, back to work, right? Now I get put on in there on Monday evening at 7.30 in the rehabilitation department. On Wednesday, two days later, the doctor comes in my room and he says, why are you on a half a liter of oxygen? And I said, I don't know. I don't try to mess with that thing. <laughs> he said, well, let me explain to you what that means. The ambient air has about that you breathe every day has about 21 to 22 percent oxygen in it. Adding a half a percent is like making it 22 and a half, 23. He says it isn't doing anything. You don't need it, so he turned it off. So two days, two days in rehab, I was already off the oxygen. So I was on October 6th, not January or whatever they thought, right? So God was healing me really, really quickly, you know. Maybe I wasn't healed like in an instant, but it, according to them, there's no medical reason that should happen, right? So then also um, on Friday, then two more days later, so at the end of the same week, um, and really I've only been in rehab, I was saying five, and really it's only four because the first day wasn't until 7.30 in the evening when I went in there, and we didn't do any physical therapy that day. So, I mean, they'd all gone home, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so two days later on Friday, five people came into my room. They, there was a doctor, there was two nurses, the, um, I had a case manager, and the lady who was the head over the rehabilitation department all came in my room, and, they, and, and I don't remember which one said it, but one of them said, we can't, we can't understand or begin to know how in the world you're even alive. It doesn't make sense. Medically, scientifically, it doesn't make any sense that you're even alive. Nobody lives from perforated lung. Also, we don't know how and can't understand and, and doesn't make any sense that we can send you home today. So instead of waiting two months or whatever and waiting until after the first year to go back to work, I, I probably could have went back to work sooner, but just to be honest, but I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> And so I waited until November 1st, because I got out of the hospital on October 8th, and I didn't go back to work until November 1st. My wife, she kind of helped me with that, because you know when you're what, I don't know, guys can probably understand this, but when you really don't want to do something and your wife gives you permission not to do it, then you're like, okay, I have permission. Not only do I not want to, but she gave me permission. So, so, so she, said, she said, I think it's good that you don't go back to work until, at least give it until November 1st. So then... God brought all my strength back to me so fast that on November 15th, we actually moved from Heston to Wichita. I was able to pick up all those boxes, moved all the furniture, did all that stuff. He has restored my strength so fast. And from having atrophy and not being able to walk and, and being in a state where I was very, very weak to just restoring everything back to me um, is incredible. And... No one really, again, no one can understand that. No one can, no one can say, uh, well, that's just, just because you know you were already in decent shape. Well, I wasn't in very good shape when I went in there. I sold cars and I didn't do any exercise each day or anything. You know, the only exercise I really did was with my mouth. You know, so I could do that. <laughs> but I, as far as my legs and my arms and my body, I didn't do a lot of work. You know, I, uh, physical labor type stuff. So I wasn't in that good a physical shape. God just restored me, and they can't, they can't, um, they can't understand how that could even happen, but um, anyway, I hope that you guys can grasp this. I hope that you guys can take this information that you've been learning from the beginning of the year that everybody has been sharing with you, and, and just take a hold of this, and go out and change people's lives. Help the people around you. Help the people you see. Change their life. You know, it's it's so rewarding to do that, even on the earth, just to see that kind of stuff. But but Jesus says when you do that, you you actually build up rewards in heaven. You know, and where's your and it talks about in His Word, and I didn't bring all that kind of information, but um, all the verses for that. But um, it talks about in His Word to keep your fo wherever your focus is, wherever your mind is, and your your thinking is. That's that's where you want, you build your reward. So are you building your reward down here or up there? And the way you build it up there is by doing what Jesus did. 
helping all those around you, becoming the resource for everybody around you. You know, if they, if so you see someone crying over in the corner, go find out why. You know, lay your hand on. They don't even have to. You don't have to even know why. If they don't want to tell you, just lay your hand on them and say, you know, in Jesus' name, be healed. In Jesus' name, I speak life and goodness into you. In Jesus' name, just something about what Jesus did. You know, He helped everybody. He didn't leave anybody out. He wants all of us to know Him, to love His Father, to love Him, to come to be with Him, man, and to help other people. It's just, it's, it's a great thing. It makes you, it makes you feel like you have self worth. If you feel like you're depressed and don't have self worth, go do that a few times. Mm -hmm. Seriously, go do that a few times. It'll change your life. It'll change your life, not just theirs, but your life. It's all about perspective. How do we see ourselves? Do we see ourselves as losers? Do we see ourselves as needing to get better? Do we see ourselves as someone who needs to please God to get the things of God? Or do we see ourselves as sons of God, receiving the inheritance of God, knowing that we have an open heaven, knowing that we have righteousness and we are justified with God, that we He is no longer against us but for us, and He is already pleased with us, right? How, what is our perspective like? We've got to change our minds, guys. We've got to change our mind to the perspective of how God sees us. Not how we are our peers or other people around us telling us, but how does God see us? He sees us as kings and priests. He sees us as, as more than conquerors. He sees us as his sons and daughters. He sees us in a whole different light than the, than the people of the world sees us. So, anyway... I just want to pray again before we leave. We're out of time. Um, uh, dear Father, thank you. Thank you that you are so good, that you see us as your sons, that you brought your son to us, and that all the things that require for us that we could be your sons and daughters, that we could actually have an open heaven, and we could talk to you, and we can relate to you, and we can have a relationship with you, God, that we never could before, Jesus. That we really couldn't before. And we thank you that you have saved us from our sin, that you are pleased with us, that you no longer see that sin because it is forgiven. It says in your word, God, that our sin is as far as the east is from the west from us, and we no longer see that, Lord God. We thank you that we are that you have blessed us and you've given us an open heaven and you have that you have made us perfect and righteous in your sight, Lord God. We thank you for that. And Lord God, I just pray for everyone here that as we would go, we would go out doing the things of Jesus, showing the world the kingdom of God, the power of your kingdom through Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.